The beginning of Mark's gospel tells us that it will be about the good news of Jesus the Christ. What exactly is the good news, and how is it made manifest in people's lives? Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin. We'll be jumping right back into the first chapter of Mark as Jesus begins his public ministry. And just as last time, this really still acts as an introductory summary of what the entire gospel will be about. So now that Jesus has finished his time in the wilderness, he will be beginning his public ministry. This is where the fun begins. We pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we read and reflect upon the gospel. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. John the Baptist is in prison, which means now that John has finished his part and Jesus becomes the center of the story. And Jesus picks off really where John left off. He begins by preaching repentance, which is what John also preached about. But Jesus adds a few things. He talks about the kingdom of God, but also that they are not only to repent, but also to believe. We are also given some more geographical context. He passes by the Sea of Galilee. This was a central landmark for a number of small cities throughout this thriving economical area. Agriculture, fishing, and various trades and crafts allowed this commercial center to flourish. And Jesus' first task seems to be to gather some people to join him in his ministry. Just like the stories from of old, God seeks those to do his will and follow his lead. Here he chooses two sets of brothers and calls them from their current vocation to something else. In the spirit of the gospel, they respond immediately and leave their nets, boats, family, and co-workers to follow Jesus. There is something urgent about this message. Jesus also makes a play on words to indicate that they will share in his ministry and bringing more people to the kingdom. In English, as in Greek, he basically adds men as the object of what they will be fishing for, indicating that his ministry involves the creation of a community. Now these verses about him picking these men seems kind of arbitrary. It seems that Jesus was just walking by the Sea of Galilee and begins calling people to follow him. Did he know these people from before? Did they see him with John the Baptist? Did Jesus know what kind of people they were that he was calling? Or was there something special about them? Or maybe there was something special about the voice of Jesus himself. And why was it sets of brothers that he called? I have so many questions. Unfortunately, we do not get the answers to these questions in this gospel. But it does echo the way in which God calls people in the Old Testament, and it shows the importance of family. Although in those stories, the brothers usually tend to be at odds with one another. And here, something different is happening. Something greater. The ministry continues as Jesus moves on to Capernaum, and this city is very important and becomes to be known as Jesus' own city. So before we get to the text, I want to share a little bit more information about the city itself. Capernaum was a central hub in Galilee and home to many of the fishermen, farmers, and tradesmen of the area. Jesus calls a number of disciples from there, performs healings, and seems to use it as a sort of base of operations for his ministry in this region. Archaeologists have uncovered a number of structures in modern-day Capernaum, including a variety of houses, one of which was believed to be Peter's house, which we will hear about shortly. We'll also read about the synagogue in which Jesus spent time in and even preached at. The ruins of a large synagogue were excavated in 1852, covered to be protected, and eventually restored in the early 1900s. Later, with continued excavations, the remains of an even earlier structure were discovered in 1968. And this structure is believed to have been the first century synagogue in which Jesus himself preached in. And so we continue our story as Jesus goes to Capernaum with his new followers. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. 
the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. These passages combine two stories, both dealing with the authority that Jesus has. The first concerns his preaching in the synagogue. Now, synagogues were places where the Jewish men could come together, study the scriptures, have conversations about it, but also um, a place of worship where they were come together to praise God. And so Jesus was invited to preach or read the scriptures in this particular synagogue. And this was a local custom where the leaders of this particular synagogue could invite other rabbis or other teachers to come and speak before their congregations. And Jesus was most likely known in the synagogue because it was probably the one that he grew up going to, being the largest one of the area in Galilee. And yet when Jesus preached, they were surprised at his teaching. You speak with authority. Interestingly enough, here we are not told the content of his teaching, but rather that he taught with authority. So what does this mean? He did not teach as the scribes and the teachers of the law did. They would interpret scriptures as well as the writings of various rabbis in order to present their arguments and lessons. If Jesus did not teach like them, but with authority, this would suggest that he did not refer to outside sources other than his own knowledge and understanding. And yet his teaching was powerful and rang true for those who heard him. It could not be disputed. It is the nature of this authority that will become very important as the gospel continues. Where does Jesus get this authority? What is its true origin? It is not of this earth. The other story concerns Jesus casting out an impure spirit. Now this can be seen as a number of different things, but in this story was really seen as a demon because it responds to Jesus. It is not simply an ailment or a mental disorder. And the demon itself seems to be scared. Because during this exorcism, we are given a hint to who Jesus is and where his authority comes from. Since these spirits are supernatural beings, they have a knowledge that humans do not. And this one gives away Jesus' identity. It addresses him first as Jesus of Nazareth, acknowledging the reality of his human nature. Then it speaks of his mission. It asks Jesus if he is there to destroy them, meaning the impure spirits, the demonic forces. And finally, reveals that Jesus is the Holy One of God. We're also given now a new title for Jesus, the Holy One of God. Now, this title is seen throughout the Bible and usually refers to someone who is faithful to God, such as in Psalm 1610. This echoes what God spoke during the baptism when he says that he is pleased with Jesus. However, the demon may also be referring to the special place that Jesus holds in his relationship with the Father. Either way, it shows that the forces of evil are worried about the intentions of Jesus and what it means for them. After this exchange, Jesus tells the spirit to be quiet. And this seems to be the first indication of the messianic secret, as it is often called. And we'll talk more about this later, but really indicates that Jesus does not yet want his popularity to be spread. For he knows that once it is, it's going to become very difficult for him to continue preaching. And he knows how quickly it's going to escalate. And Jesus has a time and a place for everything and that he is doing. And he certainly doesn't want the demons to be the ones heralding his coming. This he will leave to his disciples, but first they need to understand the message. And at this point, no one really knows the extent of his message. This passage ends with another exclamation that the people are amazed with his authority. It is the authority that he has over the word, but also over impure spirits. But there will be more to get people talking. So let's continue reading to see what happens. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house and went off to a solitary place, where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. This is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons.
Again, we have two quick stories about Jesus' ministry, the first being very specific and the second more general, but both set the tone for his ministry. So along with these two sets of brothers, he goes to the house of a couple of them, Simon and Andrew. With the mention of Simon's mother-in-law, it would be assumed that Simon was married, but Andrew most likely was not, considering he also lived with them. Households likely would hold many relatives and generations, although we don't know if Simon's mother-in-law was visiting or lived with them on a more permanent basis. Either way, she is sick with a fever. Without missing a beat, we are told that Jesus takes her hand and she is healed. On a humorous note, as a concerned Jewish mother, she immediately gets up and begins to wait on them, presumably making sure that they have enough to eat. Of course, hospitality would be paramount, especially given that there was guests at their home. Ian, eat, eat. Another way of looking at this is seeing it as a response as to one who has been touched by Jesus. And that response is often service. Healing and forgiveness are very often go hand in hand with the miracles of Jesus. And the way in which one responds is giving back and showing service to the community. The other story in these verses is that the whole town followed them to the house and suddenly Jesus is busy healing and casting out demons. His reputation has already reached the inhabitants of Capernaum and they are aware of his power over sickness and impure spirits. Once again, he commands the demons to be quiet because they know who he is. And because of such a response to his miraculous healings, Jesus finds that he cannot go anywhere without being followed. So, early in the morning, he leaves to find a quiet place to pray. Here we have another important aspect of his ministry, and that is the need for solitude and prayer. Jesus models this behavior for his followers. Even Jesus, who is the Son of God, needs to take time for himself to be alone, to meditate, and to pray. And I think this is a crucial lesson. Of course, his new followers do find him and let him know that everyone is looking for him. Instead of returning to Capernaum, Jesus invites them to follow him to other towns, where he will continue to preach. Realize he says that this is why he came, not to heal or expel demons, but firstly to preach. And so we see that the good news is the core of this narrative. And so we are told that he goes to the neighboring towns and continues to preach at their synagogues. But we are also told that he continues to cast out demons, showing that the opposition to the truth is also growing. But before we close out this chapter, there is one more healing to hear about, and also a clear example of the messianic secret. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. So this story is a little bit longer, but tells us a few more things about Jesus. First, we are told that a leper approaches him. Now, someone with leprosy, it could mean that he had any number of skin diseases. But the important thing to realize is that the leper was considered unclean and could not participate in the life of the community, which included attending the synagogue. And this also meant that anyone who interacted with the leper was also considered unclean. They believed that in some way they might be cursed or even shunned by God. And yet the leper does approach Jesus. He believes that Jesus can heal him and he asks for him to do so. And this really is a beautiful prayer that he offers to Jesus. The man with leprosy may even hold the belief that God has abandoned him. So he does not know if a holy one of God would listen to him, much less heal him. But he still believes and has the courage to ask. Jesus responds with deep feeling. Some manuscripts indicate that he was indignant, while others have filled with compassion. One reading would indicate that Jesus was upset with the concept of impurity, or even the man's doubt that he would want to heal him. The other shows that Jesus united himself with the man's suffering and had empathy with him. Either way, he involved himself emotionally in the situation and responds to the prayer. Then Jesus does a number of things. He talks to the man, he touches him, he heals him, and then he gives him some instructions. Now, simply by interacting with him, Jesus is showing him dignity. 
And by touching him, he is saying that despite the law, Jesus is still willing to become unclean to have this interaction with the man. And again, understanding the law, Jesus tells him, though, once he has been cleansed, he is to go and perform the proper sacrifices and show himself to the priests. And it also gives him a way of really witnessing to the priest what has happened to him. And he restores him not only to the community because he will be cleansed of his leprosy, but also restores him to his community of faith. Jesus also tells him not to tell anyone else about this healing. And this is, as I said before, known as the messianic secret, in which Jesus tries to keep many of these healings secret, but he's not very successful at it. He wants people to come to know him through his preaching and message, not because of his works of healing or reputation as a miracle worker. Of course, the man openly talks about what happened, which makes it impossible for Jesus to enter the towns without drawing a large crowd. So he continues much of his ministry on the outskirts of the towns. We have hit on a number of theological themes in this conversation, but the one that strikes me the most is that Jesus speaks with authority. He has an authority and the people recognize this authority. It is one that does not come from human beings, but from God himself. He understands the scriptures and is able to communicate their true meaning. He has authority over unclean spirits, again, a power that comes from God alone. He also has the power over sickness and health, the authority over the body, not only general ailments, but also determines what is clean and what is unclean, meaning that he has an authority over the law. While some displays of authority are not unknown in stories from the Hebrew scriptures, it is rare that one man would have such authority in all these areas, and that they seem to come from within himself. With many of the prophets and holy men and women of the Old Testament, they are given powers for specific circumstances, but Jesus seems to embody these traits, and as we will see, such an authority also becomes more apparent as the story continues. In the midst of such authority, Jesus does not use it as a means of power or control. He invites others to follow him, and they do so, but it is their choice. The following day, many other people come to follow him to the point where he can't even move, but again, it is their choice to follow him because of what they see in him. And he tells people when he heals them not to tell others, but he doesn't stop them from doing so. He allows them to respond in the way that they want to. Just as Peter's mother-in-law began to wait on them after she was healed, he gives them that free response. He may have authority over the word and the elements, but he gives people a choice in how they will react to his message. This is the paradox and beauty of the authority that Jesus has and really echoes that of the God in the Old Testament. Which brings us to how might we receive this message? How much authority do I allow God to have in my life? If I am really a follower of Jesus, can I make a prayer like the leper did? Knowing that I am unclean or sinful or just need help and believing that the Lord will help me, but according to his will. Asking for help, but allowing that help to come in a way that I may not understand or be prepared for is not an easy task. Jesus did heal the leper, but he also gave him instructions. When Simon's mother-in-law was healed, she also responded with action. These examples may be telling us something about the responses that come with healing and forgiveness. So as we conclude for today, what are your thoughts? Have I missed anything in these passages? And how do you understand the authority of Jesus? But thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to continuing our conversation about Mark as we enter into chapter 2. Until then, keep searching, and God bless.